During a typical lockup interview, we have our producer, our director of photography, our audio technician, an associate producer, and various staff members in the room kind of surrounding the inmate. And it can be difficult sometimes to get an intimate interview with so many people around. So we created the inmate cam, where it's basically a small digital camera we give to the inmate. So we have this camera, it's super simple to use. It's already turned on for you. They can take it into their cell, turn it on, press record, and the results are dramatic. We are the world surrounded by serial killers and material girls trapped in men's bodies. Got one eye like Cyclops, replaced pets with robots named iPod and Xbox. Fireballs falling from the sky, mudslides where the man can't explain why it's snowing in the summertime with Christian vice lords and Muslim folks feasting off clone sheep seeking truth as we blind, dude. Time goes by. Doing good, we doing bad in the last days. A wall bash locked up, extended stay. And hell yeah, the stay is extended. Judge gave me 50 years. 50. That's five decades, man. I'm gonna do y'all a quick walk around my cell real quick, man. You know, show y'all my cell, man. Show y'all what's going on in my cell. Show y'all. Where I live, how I live, all right, wake up, that's my bed, it ain't that thick, you know what I mean, it's my window, this is my window, that's the gate, teasing me with freedom, you see how cars round by, going places I can't go, because I'm trying to paint a picture for you, so you can understand what I'm going through. I look out the window a lot, a lot of inmates have the hopes and aspirations of going home. Because of the nature of my crimes, the brutality, the heinous and gruesome uh, events that occurred, I, I, I know that I'll never see the streets again. This right here, as pathetic as that is to say, this is my pillow. Doesn't nobody touch it. Ain't nobody gonna touch it. You know? I put my head on it. I, <laughs> I, I cradle it at night like it's another person, you know, because it's one of the things you, you wish you had. Now, do I want the company of another person here? Hell no. As in Ray say, that's, that's another thing I don't understand, but I ain't even get on that subject. When we give them those cameras, we have no idea what we're going to get. And it's been amazing, really. I mean, they come up with these great angles, come up with fascinating stories. It's funny. I got a $100 bill tattooed on my d but you know, I can't, I can't show that to the camera. And it's often heartbreaking. That's all I do is sit here and think about my little boy. Keep his pictures right here under the mat. Man, I don't know. Hell. I don't have no kids. I don't have a girlfriend. Philip Stroud. Serving life without parole, used his inmate cam to reach out to the families of the three men he murdered during a robbery. Every day, every day I got to remember what I did. I just wish that I can do it all over again. Not for the sake of being in here, me being here, because I've been locked up my whole life. So y'all can have y'all love us back. <coughs> Is this place stressful? Hell yeah, it's stressful. This is one of the stressful things you can do. This is what I wake up to every morning. A steel door and a piece of glass. I mean, these places are so petty. This is, they count the rolls of toilet paper you get. This is what you get every week. Four rolls of toilet paper. You're allowed three khaki outfits. You're allowed one coat. You're allowed two blankets. Everything's counted in here. Oh, now you're recording. For Joshua Coffey, who was sentenced to six years for burglary, the only thing more frightening than prison was the thought of leaving. I got nine days. I got nine days before I'm thrust back out into society. And I'm not free. Nobody thinks about 
freedom as, as something to be nervous about, you know, because everybody that uh, ever does anything wrong or scared to go to prison. I'm damn near scared to go home, you know. And the bad part is, is I got a family that loves me, you know. They might not understand me. They might not agree with the things I do. But ultimately, they love me. And I know that. And I hope I don't let them down. Hello, everybody. It's me, the Stone. James Stone wishes he had coffee's problems. He's serving 101 years for attempted murder. That's everything I pretty much got right there. You're not really allowed to have a whole lot here. He's already served 26, but has another 25 to go before he's even considered for parole. I know one guy, and I'm not going to mention his name. He gets out next year. I think it's May, the 1st of May of next year. For his third murder. Third murder. He's done been locked up for three murder bits. And because he keeps taking plea bargains, I guess that makes him better than me. I ain't got a death involved in my crime, but this guy's done killed three people on drive-by gangland shooting crap and still can't hit his target. And they still put releasing. Um, well, it all makes no sense to me. Maybe that's why Lady Justice keeps blind. Because she don't really want to see this. It don't make no sense. Several inmates use their inmate cams to offer a word to the wives. Don't come to prison, man. Warning others not to make the same mistakes they made. Being locked up is real lame. It's not a game. It's no movie. It's no rap song. When it goes down and you get popped, this is what it's going to be, man. When your buddies want to want you to join up with their little clique, their little gang, hey, let's sell a little crack. Oh, let's go get that little two, three hundred dollars from the liquor store or something like that. Just think about that. Is it worth is it? Really? Is it worth it? This ain't the place to be. This here, this is, this is where you come when you're scared. A living life. This is where you come when you've given up, basically, on everything else. Look at your family, look at yourself, see what you really got to lose. This is your future, right there, bam. Coming up. His neighbors sweating, toss, toss and churning, hearing the kids scream. Falling. Awaiting trial for murder, an inmate repudiates his former gang life. I don't want this lifestyle for no one. They use you, spit you up. Many inmates say that coming to jail made them reassess their lives, if not drastically overhaul them. We can never know with certainty how sincere those claims are. But when an inmate repudiates his gang, as 25-year-old Daniel Miramontes did, it adds credence to their story. I ran the streets, grew up in the streets, life in the streets. <laughs> what you see is what the streets created. We met Miramontes at the Orange County Jail. He said before coming here, he was a member of a Los Angeles street gang and a meth addict. It seemed out of sorts with a young man who enjoyed reading novels and writing poetry. I like to read a lot. I like Nicholas Sparks. Walk to Remember, The Notebook. Oh, so like romantics. Oh, yeah. Okay. I'm a sucker for that. Do you cry when you read the sad parts? <laughs> yeah. Most of the guys don't want to admit that because, hey, we're in jail. You know? <laughs> I don't care. But Miramontes was facing the possibility of a lifetime in prison. Been down almost two years. My charges are special circumstance murder, uh, big case, big case. Miramontes had entered a not guilty plea 
and was still awaiting trial when we met him. The night of the murder, he says he was visiting friends in an Orange County gang and that they were all drinking and high on drugs. While driving around their neighborhood, his friends stopped to confront a 19-year-old man who had allegedly flashed a rival gang sign. What ended up happening was the Orange County homeboys exited the vehicle and a fight ensued, which turned into a stabbing, which turned into a slashing, and the victim's neck was cut, and he bled to death at the scene. Miramontes admits to being in the car, but says he never participated in the murder. I'm from L.A. I'm not from Orange County, so why bother getting in the mix? So I just decided to stay in the car. One of those situations, you're in a bad place at the wrong time, you know? I was there, so I'm here now, facing a long time. Miramonte says even though he wasn't involved in the murder, he's paying a price beyond just being in jail. There's nightmares, sweating, toss and turning, hearing the kids scream, falling. Just plays in my head sometimes. Later on, we find out that the little kid wasn't even a gangbanger. So I feel bad because they actually killed an innocent kid that they didn't even gangbang. That haunts him. Though Miramontes maintains his innocence in this case, he admits to past violence with his gang. Well, the things that I did was like little things, you know? Shoot us with a different gang members, but never actually killed no one. I injured them, yeah. Killed him? No. I'm not a murderer. I'm not a hardcore gangster homie. No. My things were usually on drugs, weapons, money. Easy. I had a good grades in elementary, junior high, and high school. I graduated with 3.17. I'm a certified electrician. People used to say, hey, he works. He has a good job. But I started hooking up with different people, older friends, older guys. Serious business. So I was, hey, easy money. I'll do that favor for you, and you know, let's go. What was the easy business? Delivering here, there, math. They used me to do all these runs. Was I getting paid good money? Yeah. Was it worth it? Not really. But that's one thing that I thank God for being locked up is because being in the street, when I, when I was in the street, oh man. I was bad. I would have been probably dead within a month, a week, a year, the way I was going. I really didn't care what I was doing. Hanging out in the streets all day. There was one time I didn't sleep for like four to six days. <laughs> Just running around here, running around there. Bad. Using meth a lot. Maybe that's why I'm so skinny. <laughs> Miramonte spends large parts of his day drawing, reading, or writing poetry. He says he's forsaken his gang and is now housed in protective custody. But he says it's worth it. Well, I don't want this lifestyle. Look where you got me. No? I don't want this lifestyle for no one. They use you, spit you up. His analogy was, it's like bubble gum. When you put it in, it's real fresh and chewy. You chew it up for a little while and you spit it out. And that's his analogy of the game. He was used when he was soft and vulnerable. And once he got a little hard and a little stale, they spit him out. You know, I have to ask this. You're talking to me about a lot of your activity on the street. Does that put you in any danger? If it happens, it happens. I'm just trying to give a message out to, you know, to people out there that the gang life is not good. They use you and spit you. Killing a little kid is not good. You want to kill somebody that took your brother's life? Go ahead and do it. Just don't kill innocent kids that don't game bang. That's bad. But it's okay to kill another gang banger. If you kill your brother, if you shot your house. But when does it stop? It doesn't. I guess it keeps going until one of the, rather they kill you, you kill them. You get busted for life for killing that guy. Or he gets busted for killing you. It doesn't.
While awaiting trial, Miramonte says he made a conscious decision to not let jail bring him down. I love it out here. No? This is paradise. I mean, you could just picture it. Background, the noise. You got a little water running, but my imagination plays it as an ocean. You know? It's good. Being in here is like, hey man, I'm in Hawaii or something. <laughs> Better place than being in jail, right? Although he could face a life sentence if he is found guilty, Miramontes has chosen optimism over pessimism. Don't think negative. No matter how dark the world gets, just laugh. Just laugh. Laugh when there's nothing else to do. Laugh when the pain gets too much. That's what I do. I live my life by my own philosophy. And in here is, yesterday was a dream, right? But tomorrow's only a vision. So make every yesterday a dream of hope. And tomorrow, a dream of happiness. Coming up. Right now, I have six staff members. There's 384 inmates in this gym. It's very dangerous. One of the nation's most infamous prisons is bursting at the seams. Approximately 2.3 million people doing time behind bars in America today. That's more than China and Russia combined. And over the years, we filmed in various prisons across the U.S. where we witnessed overcrowding, overwhelming conditions that really lead to a dangerous environment. It's a zoo! It's an animal! Our first ever extended stay series was shot at California's fabled San Quentin State Prison. Designed to house just over 3,000 inmates, it was home to more than 5,000. When we shot there, Robert Ayers was San Quentin's warden. We are grossly overcrowded, which is just um, totally unacceptable for the inmates and the staff. You been here before? No. All right, come over here and stand on the fence right there. The incoming population at San Quentin was so relentless with staff releasing 150 inmates each week, but welcoming 350 new ones. Let's go, Joe, let's go, let's go, let's go. Clear the door. Many of them wound up in the gym, which had been converted into a huge overflow housing unit. When I first walked into the dorm in San Quentin, I was taken aback by how many people were packed into this small area. It was very loud. James, report to the lieutenant's office upstairs. There's always people talking, people yelling. Some people in there were trying to read, and some people in there were trying to sleep. So you'll have a big group of people having a conversation over here while a guy is trying to sleep over here. Most people would tie towels around their head to try to block out some of this noise. Give me that, Give me that one time. Officers strive to maintain order in this potentially dangerous housing area through regular inspections for weapons and other contraband. Go ahead and unlock your locker, man. Can I move something out of mine real quick? Uh-uh. Come on, Come on. Man. Come on. <laughs> Luckily, I don't have nothing illegal, as long as you don't go in my locker. <laughs> <laughs> you got the drugs. You got the inmate manufactured alcohol. You got the gangs. You got the weapons. Um, so it's, it could be real dangerous at times. Right now, I have six staff members. There's 300 and 384 inmates in this gym. It's very dangerous. Gentlemen, on your rack, on your rack, on your rack. With so many inmates crowded in the gym, correctional officers are challenged to keep minor confrontations from turning into chaos. What's wrong, dog? He's talking That's What's all that is. Huh? Now he's telling me just he's trying to run my down? life. He ain't running his arm. You just want me to pull down? I'm cool. I'm straight. I'm just telling you, he will get f***ed up in my book. Everything down here is observation. Just uh, watching, listening, getting a feel for the dorm. If you're always watching, you can tell when something's starting to go bad. Hopefully stop it before it gets bad. You know, these inmates have to share everything, share the restrooms, share the showers, day room air. Respect 
is a big thing in here. I mean, so all respecting each other, everything's fine. But if you come into a disrespect issue, that's where things get sketchy. During our stay at San Quentin, we witnessed one small but dramatic step the prison was taking to stem the flow of new inmates. Coming up. Every man inside of this building has a date that they're going to die. A group of teenagers learns the cold, hard facts about life at San Quentin. Do you want to use this restroom? When you come to prison, this is what you're putting yourself in. Built in 1852 and home to California's death row, San Quentin State Prison was bursting at the seams due to overcrowding. When we shot our extended stay series there, but San Quentin had one program designed to discourage troubled teens from ever joining its ranks in the future. Through the Squires program, selected inmates shared their experiences with teenagers who had already had run-ins with the law. What we need you to understand is that you're in San Quentin this morning. You're in a place that no kid should ever want to be in. You should be out playing somewhere in the park. But you're here because of something you did. What's your birthday? Angel. Angel? Yeah. Okay. Angel. How old are you? Uh, 13. Your girl. Okay. I'm 16. Jonathan, I'm 16 too. What you want to know? That this is your life, man. You have an opportunity to leave out of this place and never come back. Let me introduce myself to you guys. My name's David. I'm, I'm about to be 25 years old in a few more months, but I've been in prison since I was 15 years old for murder. David Monroe was serving a 15-year-to-life sentence after having pled guilty to second-degree murder. I banged before. I've been on the streets before. I'm from Stockton. I done did it before, all of it. Everything you guys say you did, everything you guys think that, that you done did, that we ain't did, we did it. Not only saying me, just it's really just about us not scolding the kids. It's not a scare straight, but we try to give you the, the communication part. Like, look, man, this is what I did. And this is what it got me. Like, this is the trophy that I was trying to earn. Is this what you want to earn? And most kids, they don't. Do you want to come to jail at 15 years old? Do you want to come to prison and have to be on the yard? Yay, stand up. Let me see how tall you are. This was me. It was my size? This was me when I came to prison. They're 15, and they look at me and I'm like, oh my God, are you serious? And that's usually what I get, like, are you serious? 15 years old, they locked you up? Can they do that? <laughs> At 50, Monroe's involvement in gang violence changed his life forever. They say you have a gun, you carry a gun, eventually you're going to use it, and it did happen. We were just with a, with a girl having fun, talking. I seen somebody walking by. We had a confrontation, and I asked him some questions about his gang affiliation and if he had problems with my gang or my street or the red period, the color red, and he said yes. And me trying to prove myself to my peers, like, yeah, okay, I'll show you that I'm down, and I reacted. And I shot him six times. And I ended up murdering him for basically a color. I never planned to commit a robbery. He never planned for his future to be doing a murder. He never planned for his life to be com committing attempted murder. It all came about by the behavior and the lifestyle we chose. Say you do a robbery, what do you think is going to happen? If you get caught, then you go to jury. What about your mom? What do you think going to happen to her? She's going to be sad and cry. And hurt, right? Uh, yeah. And you shaking your head, so you, you know that it can happen to your mother, too? Yeah. Okay, if y'all know this, why would you put yourself in that situation? Maybe you got to take a risk sometimes. Take a risk sometimes? Yeah. You don't think about it, and that's, that's the part about being a juvenile. You're not fully thinking of what you're doing. You're just trying to be cool. You're trying to fit in. I'm real offended by what you said, and I'm putting myself in your mama's shoes right now. You telling me you willing to sell your mama out for whatever it is you think you need it. What would you rob him for? It's worth it. You must really want it, so you're taking a risk to do it. What, what would you rob? I don't care what you say. It's it worth it. Ain't nothing worth my mama to me. Nothing. But you guys ain't never really paying attention to how you hurting your mom. Monroe never realized how his crimes would hurt his own mother until the day he was sentenced. When the judge had actually said that you're a cold-blooded murderer and I'm trying you as an adult to be sentenced to 15 years of life in prison, I heard my mom scream. And it's just, it's horrible. It was a horrible feeling. Like, physically, emotionally, mentally, it was just horrible. And, you know, I put my head in my lap and I cried. The boy
boys are also given a preview of the stark conditions they might face if they ever enter the California prison system. I want you guys to get a good look at this restroom. This is where you're going to use the restroom. <coughs> look how they take care of this place. Do you want to use this restroom? You come to prison, this is what you're putting yourself in. Because you have no privacy once you're in prison. That's what you guys are coming to. Yeah. The boys are then taken to the prison block that holds those condemned to death. Uh, first off, I just want to let you guys know that, like, I seriously hate this place right here. This is the place where people come to die. Every man inside of this building has a date that they're going to die. Do you guys know the exact day you're going to die? That's none of our intentions is to murder somebody, die, and be a big old uh, gang hero. We just try to educate them. That's the main thing. Is they need to know what they're doing wrong and know how to change it. You can make a difference today. You don't have to wait until you get to condemn row. You can keep your birth date and don't know your death date. You can do that. It's up to you. Can you guys do that? Are you guys willing to take that chance? Really, what I got out of it was I don't want to end up in jail. So I got to start watching what I'm doing, start making better choices. Because one little messed up choice could ruin my whole life. The thing I learned is I don't want to be here. That's about it. It ain't a good place to be. It has to come within you. You have to want to change. I've always said this, that this is for my victim. I can't give him his life back, but I can save somebody else's life because of what I did. And I hope his family knows that you know, what happened to him, it's not in vain anymore. Some people are actually being saved. All right, y'all take care, man. Take care. Hopefully we don't see you again. That's the hope. We don't see you again. San Quentin is just one of numerous prisons or jails across the nation where inmates and staff provide cautionary tales for troubled youth. At the Suffolk County Jail in Boston, Massachusetts, we encountered another program called Jailbreak. Just remember, when you're visiting here, you're going to get experience what it is to be in jail. They're going to have you empty everything out of your pockets, put into locker. Make sure you take everything out of your pockets, all right? Hat, you take the hat out. Show some respect. Take everything out of your pockets. Change quarter of nickels, anything. Bus passes. When we film in a prison or a jail, we do do our best to be a fly on the wall. In the case of jailbreak, uh, the, you know, these kids came in and, yeah, they were definitely aware of the camera. You scared? Are you scared? How about you? No. You're not scared right now? No. There's no reason to be scared to tell you the truth. At the same time, I don't think it was necessarily the camera that affected them in the way that they had an attitude or they had this certain bravado. I think it was more relating to age. Everybody stand up. I'm right over there. Right now, all you're gonna do is empty your pockets, take your jackets off, nothing should be around your wrist, in your ears, or in your pockets. Everybody over there. Put these uniforms on over your clothes. Hurry up. These kids are from the Boston Public Schools. They were suspended from school because of something that they did. Tuck your shirts inside, guys. Everybody, tuck your shirts inside. Once they have the uniform on and I start yelling at them and start talking to them in a way that, you know, they know that I'm in control, then they don't know what to do, so they just break down. You're 12 years old, dude. 12 years old and you want to cut somebody, assault somebody. Okay? Keep on smiling like there's something funny here. All right? Keep your mouth shut. 16-year-old Damon Pope, however, who had recently been caught with marijuana, appeared determined to not break down. You're in jail right now, 16. You'll be 17 in a month. And you have this attitude like, you're too good to be in this place. You're going to run this place. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? You think you're that good? You goals? Tell me about your goals. My goals trying to entrepreneur, you know, own a business, possibly take over this jail, you know? Then I can just be at home like Donald Trump, collecting money, writing checks, okay. possibly writing you a check, you know? Uh-huh. That sounds great. I'll tell you what your goals are. You're going to be in one of these units, all right, if you continue to do the things that you're doing. In a month, I'll give you less than that, okay? Because 17 years old, you'll walk through that back door and you will not leave. You understand me? You will not leave. And that's what's going to happen to you. That's where you're going. Everybody, put your arms out, put your thumbs down. All the way up. I don't have anything big enough for him. 
Grab a piece of string and tie his arms together. He's not even strong enough to break that. Yo, these are mad tight. Oh, they're not made for comfort. All right, but get I'm not used here to them. Being get jailed, used to them. So... Get used to them. Why are you so Keep your mouth cold? shut. What I Keep do your mouth you? shut. I don't like punk little kids coming into my jail thinking it's cool. But I ain't disrespect All right? you though. I don't care. All right, so I don't, don't care because you're in my jail thinking you're tough. I didn't okay? think I was tough. Keep your I mouth shut. That? That's what I want you to do right now. Okay, that's what I want you to do right now. Pick up your feet and move. This a life you want to have. The boys are escorted into the jail and placed in separate cells. Face that corner right there. Are you making your mother proud? No. Are you going to change your ways? You know you got a friend coming, right? You got a roommate. Are you ready for him? Oh, you are? You're ready for him, huh? Coming up. Take these sneakers off right now, mother Kick him off, tough guy. The kids meet the inmates. Getting money and smoking weed is going to end you in jail for a time. During our extended stay shoot at the Suffolk County Jail in Boston, three inmates, pre-selected by jail staff, okay. were about to introduce themselves to four young men participating in the jailbreak program. The 12-year-old uh, in cell one, he's here for cutting his teacher. Yo, what's up, man? What's up? I'll leave. We have two fireworks in school. What's up? What's up? What's up? What's up? Uh, marijuana in three. And marijuana in four. Go this is a game. One in four is 16. Uh, birthday's next month. So he's a heartbeat away from being in here. Getting money and smoking weed is going to end you in jail. Either or. Either or. Take your sneakers off right now. Take your sneakers off right now, mother. Kick him off. Tough guy. They always take their shoes away because it's something that they know that happens in jail, and we tell them, "You come to jail, you're gonna lose your shoes." He did. Huh? Why are you crying now? You wasn't crying when you cut your teacher. Oh, you cut your teacher? Oh, yeah, you back up a little bit. A little nah, bit. Man. Oh, no nah, man. You gotta get this, dog. Oh, you, you gotta know. You gotta, you ain't get this. Because you ain't back up, right now. That's what you want to come to jail for, right? A pair of these, right? Well, I'm going to take them from you. Who sneakers are these? I'm going to take these sh**. These are yours? Yeah, I brought them. I'm keeping them. Yeah, you can have those. Take those. You brought those, right? You can have those. Those are yours. These are mine. Let me see you take it. Yeah. yeah that's, that's what happens in here every yeah. day. That's I what happens in here. I'll take your shit. I'll take your shit. I'll take yours. I'll take yours. And you won't do nothing about it. You understand? You understand me? Yes. What? I can't hear you. Do you understand me? Yes. All right, guys. Let's go. Hurry up. Let's go. It's not often that you see all the inmates, you know, working together towards a common cause. And once those kids were brought up into that unit, you could tell that everyone was there to put the fear inside them. To me, While the three younger boys seem shaken at times, 16-year-old Damon Pope maintained his nonchalant attitude. Can you tell me, Tom? Why, you got somewhere to go? Nah, because I'm like... Just keep your mouth shut, all right? I really don't get my sneakers, Keep though. your mouth shut. You know how much I What I tell you? I don't give a how much you pay. All right, you're in jail. You're in jail, OK? Welcome to National Street Jail. Step on your back to the wall. We followed the kids up to one of the housing units so they could see where one of their next bedrooms could be if they continued on this path. And I think that was probably one of the scariest parts for the kids, the idea of being locked up actually inside of a cell. 
Get in there. Welcome home. Oh, there's only two beds. You got to share beds. Have a seat. Make yourself comfortable. That's where you're going to be. That's you want to live, little And you want to cut people. You want to cut people. They can't let you out the door when you want to go home now. Go in there. Go on. I'm going to put you in there with them. I'm going to put you in there with them. Yeah, he's going in. You want to go in there? Huh? Let's go. Let's go. You got a bed for him? No. Oh, no, he's sleeping on a bed with me. Oh, okay. That's my new bitch. Get in here. When one person's using the bathroom, what is the other one going to do? This is going to be you. This is the wires. This is it. This is your view right here. Right here. It's steel. It's not a curtain. It's not blinds. It's just vines. That's your home. That's your bed. You got to stay in one room the whole time for every day of the year, for how long you're here for. That's that's crazy. Everybody out. Let's go. Stand over here. Everybody else, go that way. You think this one nigga's not a big boy? Who sneakers are those? They were yours, right? They're his now. Ask him if you can have your sneakers back. You don't want to ask him. Merry Christmas. Get out of here. Are you scared you're going to end up here? If they keep doing the things I'm doing, yeah. You're going to go in the bathroom, you're going to take my uniforms off, you're going to fold them nice and neat, and you're going to bring them up to me. Everybody understand, right? Yes. Keep on making those noises. Keep on making noises. What am I doing, though? Just because you're walking out the front door doesn't mean you, uh, you won't see me again and you won't be back in this place. I'm not going right? to be back. Three weeks. Remember that. Google me. Remember that. Google. I won't have to. You'll just put you, check you up in the computer when you get there. He's going to end up in this place if he really doesn't change. He's really going to end up in here. And he's so close to being 17. And at 17, you will end up in this place. And he doesn't understand that. He thinks everything is a joke. And he thinks he could do this. You're a good dude, man. No lie. Like, you do your job well. Yeah. Hopefully, I don't have to do my job with you. The other three... I think they learned their lesson. Pulp might have as well. Nearly a year after our shoot, he had not returned to the Suffolk County Jail. Coming up. Ain't done no wrong. Inmates who use their time to hone their talents. Out in California. Depending on the inmate, doing time can result in endless boredom or inspire new heights of creativity. That's the V-twin motor. This inmate, who asked to only be identified by his nickname, Lucky, used his time at San Quentin State Prison to create intricate models from soap, oil, and paper. I carve it out. That's the tread of the tire made out of soap. Takes a long time. I've been doing it for like six years and it keeps me from being depressed and angry and everything else. What do these banks mean to you? What do they represent? I don't know, I guess freedom. Because, you know, you got to be free to actually ride them. Lucky's models were more than just a hobby. He made one special bike as a gift to his daughter, whom he had never met. She's nine years old. She's never had her dad. And I don't know how to be a father, so I really don't know what to give her. I want to give her something she don't have. We met Christopher Lashbrook at the Lyman Correctional Facility in Colorado. He spent much of his time practicing his music. It was the primary link that connected him to his father. The relationship was nearly destroyed by abuse. My dad tried everything to punish me. The slaps and kicks turned into punches and headbutts, broken nose. There's no doubt about it. He, he was abused at my hands. How you doing? Hey, how are you doing? I love my dad. There is distance between us because I spent so much time incarcerated. The bond that's always kept him and I together has been the music. <laughs> You're my teacher. <laughs> he taught me how to play man. You know? He's a musician, and he's rubbed that off on me, and I've been fortunate enough to have that talent.
In some cases, a prison sentence allows an inmate to discover a talent he might never have known he had. For Clay Lopez at California State Prison Corcoran, doing time led him to the harmonica. I'm almost 50 years old and I'll be over 50 when I get out. So I don't have a career or anything. So I thought, well, you know, if I learn to play the harmonica, I can at least pay my own rent when I get out there, even as a street musician, if I'm sober, I think I'll do okay. I started to play the harp better when I lost this tooth. I started getting the twangy sound the way it's supposed to sound, and I was never so happy to lose a tooth. It makes this harp sound real good. You can play what you feel without reading music, and uh, I've tried to play guitar, piano, all kinds of stuff, and I never went anywhere, and not that I'm going anywhere with this, but um, I know a few songs, mostly hymnals, gospel songs, and uh, a few of my own, and it just expresses me. And Lopez was serving a 20-year sentence on 27 counts of burglary. But it was his exposure to inmates serving life terms that inspired him to pay them tribute through his songs. I just wanted to do something for, for the lifers to kind of express them. Well, I can sing you the last verse and speak for itself. It goes, uh, Ain't done no wrong since the days of old out in California. Ain't no parole when I'm carried away in the coral inner's car. Someone tell the warden to please ship me to the Dixie line. Because the only way they're, they're going to get out is when, well, when the angels come down and pick them up and take them home. That's why it's got that train sound, see? Pelican Bay State Prison in Northern California, home to many of the most sinister convicts alive. The challenging art of transporting convicts is faced not only on a national scale by Con Air, but also on a much smaller level, within the walls of America's penitentiaries. Nowhere is this challenge more daunting, perhaps, than at the Pelican Bay State Prison in California. A 275-acre facility located near the Oregon border, Pelican Bay is designed to isolate nearly 4,000 of the state's most violent inmates. Pelican Bay State Prison is referred to as housing the worst of the worst. In order to transport such volatile convicts between various facilities over the far-flung prison compound, corrections officers here rely on uniquely designed equipment 
and well-rehearsed procedures. To move the dozens of inmates each day required to go to Pelican Bay's medical clinics, guards use a special lockdown bus, a mobile prison inside the walls. Maximum 10 inmates on the bus at one time to take them to the clinic or to return them back. Little cages here to prevent them from, from spitting or spearing or anything or such. The bus is checked frequently to make sure no contraband has been stashed and that nothing has been removed which may be fashioned into a weapon. Security is further enhanced by the lack of any centralized bus stop where convicts could gather and come into conflict with each other or with guards. Service is door to door. Lieutenant Ben Grundy has been with Pelican Bay since its inception in 1991. Security is very high at this prison. You, you'll you notice when you go in and come out, you have to go through a number of checks, number of what we call sally port, double gates, and numerous doors that are uh, electronically operated. Even when convicts are moved simply on foot, they are subjected to the tightest possible security standards. Everywhere we go, we're being escorted to the medical department on a visit. When we're doing escorts in a tense situation like this, we make sure that it's a hands-on escort. Putting California's worst inmates together in Pelican Bay resulted in the greatest concentration of racially allied prison gangs in the state, a powder keg of racial tension that would eventually reach its breaking point. On February 23rd, we had the major riot. We had a big race war out here on, on B Yard. The riot was one of the worst in state history. As rival gangs began to retaliate against each other, the prison descended into a violent race war. There's a race war pretty much amongst all the inmates. You know, there's, there's no telling when one might go after another. At Pelican Bay, the simple act of walking across the prison yard can get an inmate killed. Even though an inmate is locked up at Pelican Bay State Prison, he is a convicted felon. He has a right to walk on the general population or move around within the prison system without being stabbed. To protect the inmates, prison officials declared a state of emergency. There's a lot of racial incidents here between inmates. And there's been so much, we're on lockdown. When we're locked down, basically what that means is that the inmate movement is greatly restricted. They're not allowed to come out on the general population yard and play basketball or volleyball and just kick it with their homeboys. They are locked down. They spend most of their time in their cell. We don't mix up races. In the first stage of the lockdown, the inmates were only allowed to mix with other inmates of their own race. They'll stab each other because somebody might not have been involved in one of the other race wars. Those who didn't participate in the race war were targeted by their own race. They've been attacking each other, their own racial groups, and the people that they should be getting along with. So we've gone to a total lockdown. Pelican Bay's total lockdown has created a unique situation where even prisoners locked in an institution require full-time security from other prisoners. Every inmate movement is uh, calculated. They're handcuffed to go to the showers. They're handcuffed to go to the doctor. For the inmates' protection, Pelican Bay's notorious killing fields, the yards, are kept vacant. If we let these people out right now, uh, there's, there's no question in my mind or any of anybody else's mind that they would definitely assault each other, uh, possibly with weapons, and possibly even come after one of us. They're scared to let us off. They want no more violence. If we let them go without the handcuffs and the hands-on escorts right now, there would there'd be blood on the yard all day long. 
Inmates are searched for weapons each time they move outside their cell block. Some go to extreme measures to move weapons and contraband. We want the inmate to uh, take off his clothes so we can check all his body orifices, you know, look in his mouth, look in his ears. Um, we have them stand there, they bend down so we can see uh, between their legs and they spread their buttocks so that we can make sure that they don't have anything secreted. Another officer will take a handheld metal detector. We'll have the inmate bend over at the waist and he'll wand his backside because they usually try to secrete something. Basically, they're, they're placing weapons in their buttocks and in their rectal cavity. Inmates manufacture weapons out of any piece of material they can get their hands on. They're masters at hiding weapons. Some of them probably do have weapons, and we miss that, but that's just the nature of the game. As tightly guarded as these prisoners are on the so-called main line, Pelican Bay boasts a facility that is even more restrictive. The secure housing unit, or the SHU, is essentially a prison within a prison. The purpose of the security housing unit is to remove the inmates that are causing problems or committing felonies uh, from the general population. They have demonstrated that they can't function in that environment without acting out or causing people around them harm or attempting to prey on them. So they're removed from the general population and they're locked up. Here, prisoners are locked in their cells 23 hours a day. Everything they need to serve their sentence is contained here. There is no out of doors. Inside of the security housing unit, or the SHU, inmates are escorted everywhere they go. Everywhere these predatory offenders move within the SHU, they are always under the watchful eye of an armed guard on a catwalk above. Anticipating violent outbursts, the guards protect themselves with armored vests designed to repel knife attacks. Due to the level of these inmates and their violence, there's always a possibility to be stabbed or speared or attacked um, in a security housing unit. All officers are, are mandated to wear the vest. When an inmate is escorted in the shoe, he is never allowed to proceed a correctional officer through a doorway. To prevent contact between inmates, the officer will always make sure the area is clear before proceeding with his prisoner. Prisoners are strip searched every time they leave their cells. A transport to the library within the SHU requires yet another extreme security precaution. They'll be hooked together. With the chain that hooks them together, we can use less staff to move more inmates. We have to give the inmates access to all the legal materials so they can file their cases. They review the books there, turn the books back in, and then they return to their cells. Allowed only 30 minutes inside the library, convicts are strip searched yet again before they are returned. They're allowed to bring back three sheets of paper um, with the information they needed, and that's all they're allowed to bring back. The inmates are moved by, by uh, unit so that they can't pass information on from unit to unit to unit. It's, it's just our attempt to try to keep down the, the uh, gang information flow. Uh, we do it as good as we can. We know it still gets around. Even prisoners in the SHU are sometimes required to be moved outside Pelican Bay's secure walls for court appearances or medical appointments. As level four inmates, the highest security risks, they are then subjected to an even greater security measure. Even within the institution, they have to be escorted. But when they leave the institution, it's a whole another matter. The vehicle that they're in, in effect, becomes a prison on wheels. And we do not have the luxury of the fence as a perimeter, uh, nor do we have the prison walls. It's not business as usual. It's very serious, and they're still dealing with a level four convicted felon that they need to get back inside of the walls. Pelican Bay is probably one of the most secure prisons in the state of California. Really the only time anybody would have a chance of uh, breaking somebody out is when we're out on one of these transports. The prison convoy is inspected exhaustively inside the Sally Port, a double-gated checkpoint where everything going in or out of the prison must first be authorized.
Here, officers are issued weapons for their venture outside the walls. Anytime you take out a level four, it's uh, one sergeant, three officers, and everybody's armed. We don't give them any prior notice. That way, uh, there's less chance of them being able to uh, notify anybody on the outside that they're out. Less chance of a, a, an escape attempt. On this day, the transportation team is moving inmates to a local hospital for appointments with heart specialists. To minimize the chance of an ambush by a convict's accomplices lying in wait along the road, officers vary their route daily, avoiding predictability. Anything can go wrong when you're outside of the walls. You have to uh, be careful about what could be a staged event. You could uh, have a, a cuff key inside of a body cavity and try to take off his restraints. Throughout their venture outside the walls, inmates are never out of a correctional officer's sight. That armed officer actually has hands on the inmate. And the uh, armed officer just follows at a safe distance to provide uh, gun coverage in case the inmate tries something. The Pelican Bay transportation officers have mastered the art of moving society's most dangerous criminals just like their counterparts aboard Con Air. Whether it's transporting a prisoner across the yard or across the country, law enforcement is using extreme security procedures to make sure the general public is kept safe. We take every precaution to make sure that the public is not confronted by those types of individuals. We've been in the business of moving prisoners for a long time, and there's probably not a lot of things that we haven't seen. I feel very confident that uh, the public is not at risk when these inmates are being transported from prison to prison. We've moved hundreds of thousands of prisoners without an escape. From vans to buses to the specialized fleet of jets, the mission is the same taking prison safely on the move. We do the same thing that any jail, any prison, federal, state, county, we just do it 35,000 feet in the air and a lot faster. 